There you go. Okay, awesome. We are recording. So welcome to the Goddess Connection Circle for the month of January 2022. And we start off this new year with Inanna. So Goddess Inanna. Has anybody heard of Inanna? I just want to have like a general idea. Are you guys familiar with Inanna or is this like first time you hear about her? So Tass says, yes, she's heard of her. I have not. You've never heard of Inanna? Okay. Uh, when I read Moon Under Her Feet. Okay, she's a Sumerian goddess, I think. Yes, she is a Sumerian goddess. Um, and I'm sure that Jazz and Claudia and Mel have heard of Inanna. So Inanna is, uh, oh, and Ali. Oh, that's right. I'm sorry, Ali. I didn't see you. That's right. You, I didn't see you for some reason. Oh, okay. I see you now. Okay. Hi, Ali um yeah okay so inana <laughs> hello so let me i'm gonna go ahead and share a um powerpoint and we'll get to know inana and then i'll talk a little bit about her story Give me one moment while i share documents here uh bup, 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 bup. where is my inana Inanna, Inanna, Inanna. Hold on one second. Inanna. I think I have to go to. Oh, it's it's on images. Wait a minute. Um, documents. Okay, I think this is it. Inanna. Oh my God, where is my Inanna? Hold on. Bear with me, guys. I'm sorry. I have it. Marlou you have it? it to, yeah, Marlou sent it to me if you want me to. Yeah, okay. could you? Because I yeah. saved it and I thought <laughs> I, I was going to. Yes, thank you. I thought I was going to be able to pop it right up. And I don't know why it's not coming up. And even though I had it saved. I got you. Thank you so much. Mel to the rescue. <laughs> Can everybody see my screen? You should be able to. Yes. Okay. I see awesome. your screen. Awesome. Okay. So this is an absolutely beautiful picture that Mel found for me on Inanna. Like, I love it very cool picture and it's a very appropriate picture and you'll see why in a moment and i'll explain why this picture not only is beautiful but really awesome so who is inanna she is an ancient mesopotamian goddess inanna also has other names which we'll go into it we'll talk about her family tree she is also the queen of heaven and not just queen of heaven but queen of the universe so we'll talk about that she has influence in modern society We'll talk about her sacred symbols and rituals to the goddess. You can go to the next slide for me. So goddess Inanna, here's two pictures of goddess Inanna. Uh, then the picture to the right, I am sure that you may have seen this picture before where it shows her with her different sacred animals and it shows her with the wings. Now, interesting thing, if you guys have seen pictures of another goddess, Lilith, um, you will see very similar depiction of Lilith and Inanna, okay? So they are not exactly the same goddess, but it's that very similar energy and very similar way of portraying her in, in, in temples and in ancient uh, tablets. So you will see Inanna and Lilith pictured very similarly, and also another goddess, which I will talk about in a moment. You can go to the next slide for me. So she is the primary goddess of summer, Sumer or Sumeria, worshipped by the Sumerians from the early period of ancient Mesopotamia around 4000 BC. She is one of the most ancient goddesses okay it's it, to get more ancient than inanna is difficult um 
a close a close second would be Lilith. Lilith and Inanna would be up there as an, an Asherah, which we'll talk about in a moment. So those would be one of the most ancient goddesses in history. Like pretty much all of the other goddesses come after. You can go to the next slide for me. So she is a Sumerian goddess of sex and war. Okay, goddess of war, sensuality, procreation, love, lust. Okay, so definitely considered a love goddess. She has that Venusian love energy, but with a touch of war. So very similar to Freya. If you remember, I don't know if you were all in the Freya circle in December. Freya is very much a goddess of love, procreation, fertility, beauty, but also war. There is that war aspect. Uh, Inanna has a little bit of that war aspect as well. Okay, she is depicted... Uh, in the armor of a male wearing a uh, yeah so most love goddesses are also goddesses of war um yeah it, it's it's interesting when it's true um the exception would be aphrodite aphrodite is not so much a goddess of war yet interesting enough venus which is aphrodite's roman counterpart does have a little connection with war. Not that she's considered necessarily a war goddess, but there is a Roman goddess of war that was kind of sort of melted into the myth of Venus so that Venus took on a little bit of those warlike qualities. So yes, that is correct, that most of the love goddesses have a connection with either warrior energy, war, you know, something to do with war um, or, or protection or defense. So all of that is very true, very true. Um, here she's depicted with a quiver and a bow. You can go to the next section for me. So here are some other names that Inanna is known. If you ever look up Inanna, Inanna is known as Inin, Nini, Ninar, Inina, Irina, Nana, Nin, Enin, and Ninana, and Inini. So tons of different ways of saying her name. Okay. Now, if you could tell here, she one of her sacred animals is the lion. And it's interesting because you don't see a lot of love goddesses that are depicted with lions. But if you look in the Egyptian pantheon, you will see that, um, yes, this is the goddess they worshipped in the movie The Red Tent. Yes, yes, Ali, it's Inanna. Um, she's, because she's such an ancient goddess, right? She's such an ancient goddess and she's so connected to women, very protective of women. Um, yes, there is a movie, Red Tent movie. Um, so Inanna is depicted here with a lion. Um, when you think of the Egyptian pantheon, I just wanted to mention, if you think of Hathor, who is technically the love goddess in the Egyptian pantheon, right? And also Bast is also associated to love as well. Both Hathor and Bast have connection to lions, to felines, to cats. I mean, Bast is depicted as a cat goddess, right? But there is that feline energy. So Freya, as you know, also, right? Freya is associated to the cat, to the cat, and she has a chariot drawn by cats. So there's a very strong connection of love goddesses and cats or feline energy, including lions, tigers, and anything, anything of the feline, of the feline family. So I just wanted to point that out so that you see that there is definitely a connection. Dorga, yes, Dorga sits on a lion. We're gonna, and it's funny that you mentioned Dorga because we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. There are connections. There are definitely connections. You can go to the next slide for me. So here is Inanna's family tree. Her father is Enki, god of water, knowledge, mischief, crafts, and the creation. He's also considered one of the Anunnaki. If you've ever heard of the Anunnaki, the Anunnaki is where Enki comes from, and Inanna is considered an Anunnaki as well. Mother is unknown. 
older sister is Arishkago, goddess of the underworld to the Sumerians. Her twin sister, which is Utu, is the sun god or goddess. And she's female, but she is considered like the god or goddess of the sun. Sometimes she's depicted as male, sometimes she's depicted as female, most of the times depicted as female, but she has that, that duality to her. And then her consort or husband, you could say, is, Dum is Dumizi, Dumizi or Dumizi, which is how, you, it's how it is spelled. And he was a shepherd, originally a shepherd, and no children. Inanna has no children that are known to her. Not, not, not given any children in her myths. You can go to the next slide for me. The dual nature of the goddess. Okay, so here she is again, depicted with a lion, feline energy. She has wings, which the whole characteristic of the wings is, as you know, Isis is also pictured with wings. Wings is a way of showing that she is heavenly that she is of the other realm. She's also a queen, queen of heaven and queen of the universe. So a lot of times when goddesses have titles of queen of the universe or queen of heaven or queen of the other world or, of, or of, of, you know, of any world that is not earth or, or the underworld necessarily, they depict her a lot with wings. It's so it's like that heavenly, like type of connection, which Isis also has. And so, so does Inanna. She's pictured with wings and without wings. People of summer, the city identified her for having a dual nature, which included both masculine and feminine traits. So her masculine traits is where we see that aspect of war, where she is a goddess of love, sexuality, fertility, but she's got that warlike quality that comes from her masculine trait. And then the feminine traits, which is what makes her very Venusian, or very connected to the Venus quality or love goddess quality. She had correct characteristics of both the genders, which include being independent, being sensual and powerful at the same time. Go to the next slide for me. Queen of heaven. Goddess Inanna was seen as the bright star of morning and evening, as well as the constellation Venus. So just like Venus is the brightest star in the sky, right? And we say that Venus is the morning star and the evening star, right? Which makes her what we call Luciferian or one that brings in the light. So is uh, the goddess Inanna. She has that quality. So this is where her connection with Venus comes in, which makes her very what we call Venusian, a Venusian goddess, a goddess that is very connected to the energy of Venus because she has that same quality when it comes to the constellation Venus and the, her connection to the stars. She's so once again, identified with the Roman goddess Venus. Go to the next slide for me. So she's also, interesting enough, associated to the rain and the storehouse. Storehouse meaning like where you, in ancient times, where you would keep grains, okay? Where you would keep grains, where you would keep the harvest that you would gather and get it ready for the winter. You would keep it in a safe space, right? And that is one of the associations, interesting enough, that Inanna has. She ends, once again, associated to rain. So she's personified as the goddess of dates, wool, grain, and meat. The gates of the storehouse were her emblem, okay? Besides this, also goddess of rain and thunderstorm. These associations linked her with the sky god An, okay? Who was the god, considered the sky god for the Sumerians. And go to the next slide for me. So, Akkadian and Babylonian. Now here, this is very interesting. Though she was primary a deity of the Sumerians and named Inanna, she was later adopted by the Akkadians and the Babylonians. So this same goddess was adopted by other cultures. When they adopted her, they renamed her. So she was renamed Ishtar by the Akkadians and Babylonians. So technically Ishtar was for the Babylonians. They called her Ishtar. And then we're going to see the Akkadians, which was another group of, of people, another tribe, um, named her Astarte. Go to the next slide for me. 
So influence of the goddess. Before the ruling period of King Hammurabi, which dated between 1793 and 1750 BC, women were considered equal to men. The reason behind this was Inanna, who always fought for the rights and equality of women. Inanna symbolizes leadership and is credited with bringing civilization to humanity. Okay, remember we're talking about a very ancient culture, very, very ancient culture. Okay, and during that period of time, there was equality among the sexes. Okay, very equal, like the whole concept of patriarchy, matriarchy, it wasn't, it wasn't the way that it is now. It was very predominantly a lot, a lot of connection to mother goddesses and a lot of equality. And then slowly that started to change. But during this period of time, it was very strong that way because of Inanna. But can you go to the next slide for me? Queen of the universe. So Inanna fought against the wrong and managed to take over powers from many powerful gods, including An, Enki, and Enlil. Due to this, she was known as queen of the universe and was considered the Akkadian counterpart of the West Semitic goddess Astarte. Once again, they show her here with wings and the lion. So Astarte is how she is known for the Akkadians and Ishtar for the Babylonians. But if you look at depictions of her, historical depictions of her in tablets and in manuscripts, you will technically always see her with wings and you will always see her usually with a sword or a knife in her hand and a lion or a tiger. So there's that, you know, it's, it's obvious that the connection is there. It's the same goddess, but seen through different lenses, through different cultures. We'll go to the next slide for me. And uh, I wanted to picture this here because she's got a kind of a modern, uh, a modern connection as well. So Inanna was later adopted by other cities and was worshipped as one of their major goddesses. She managed to endure the rising patriarchy and was not replaced by any other male god during that time. Since during that period, many other goddesses were replaced by gods. But she remained strong and her attitude led to become an icon for modern feminism. So it's funny because um, as, as, as I was researching this, I saw that there's a lot of groups and a lot of like feminist groups and, and, and things like that that like to call themselves daughters of Inanna. So they have that Inanna com comes up very much as that kind of connection. And if, if you're familiar with Lilith, which I know some of you are familiar with the goddess Lilith. Lilith is very much a goddess that is embraced by feminist groups and women that want to take on that energy of empowerment that, Lily, that Lilith provides. Well, Inanna is very similar, very similar concept. Um, that energy of the very independent, strong female. Um, so very strong connection. Inanna has, as well as Lilith. So they, they have that in common. You can go to the next slide for me. So the priestesses and devotees of Inanna. So they, she had different types of priestesses. Very interesting. She had the Kurgara, which were the musicians of the goddesses. These were, these were priestesses that were involved in making music for her. So they were, they were considered her personal musicians. Then she had the Zal Sikrum, the women and men that were priests and priestesses of the goddess. So these were men and women that would dedicate themselves to worshiping her and connecting with her and helping other people do the same. So they were like her representatives on earth, literally. And then there's the Kulu, Kulu or, or Kalum, who would compose the hymns to sing her praise, okay? So Inanna was a goddess that inspired a lot of music. Even though she wasn't technically a goddess of music, but she inspired that in people. So a lot of her followers would play musical instruments, sing hymns, and connect to her that way. So they she literally had priestesses that would only do that. They would compose hymns to sing her praise. And then there is the Asinu, which were groups that lamented 
like had lament singers of Inanna. So the myth of Inanna, which we'll go into in a minute, she has an interesting myth where Inanna dies and comes back to life. And so there were lament songs written for her. And she had a group of priestesses and priests that would only sing songs of lament. So this is, she's a pretty interesting goddess where she has like different types of priestesses and priests that did different things within worshiping her. So, which is different from other, other goddesses. We don't see that kind of distinction, but we see that in Inanna. You can go to the next slide for me. So other goddesses associated to Inanna. So here we see Durga. Durga in Hinduism, very connected to Inanna, very similar energy, right? Durga is all about protection and warlike quality. She has that warlike protection quality that Durga has. But Durga also has that abundance, connection of abundance and, and fertility and beauty. There's, there's, that, there's that energy to Durga. Right, like we see in Lakshmi as well. Lakshmi, goddess of abundance, goddess of beauty. So there's, there's very connected. They're all very connected. So a lot of people they see when they see Durga, they think Inanna. Like there's that mental connection. Ashtoreth or Asherah, as she is also known, which is a Canaanite goddess that was adopted by the early Hebrews and was considered the queen or goddess or wife of Yahweh. Okay, so if you all don't know, Yahweh had a wife, okay, and there's parts of the Bible in the Old Testament that actually mention Asherah by name. So Asherah and Ashtoreth are the same goddess and also connected to Inanna. And then here we have the Roman goddess Venus, okay, uh, Venus, Aphrodite as well, connected to Inanna, and then we have Minerva, okay, or Athena, Minerva in Roman, Athena in Greece. So just like Minerva and Athena had that war, you know, they're goddesses of war, right? They're, they're war goddesses, literally, goddesses of wisdom, but also war. So Inanna has that quality as well. She was considered very wise, considered queen of heaven, queen of the universe, but she had that warlike quality. So these are some goddesses that are definitely connected to Inanna. You can go to the next slide for me. Some of her sacred symbols. And this is a really interesting tablet, as you can see here. Okay. Um, some of her symbols are the eight point star, the rose, okay, and the lion. Lions were included in all of her symbols to to I'm sorry to resemble her power and bravery. She was also shown riding on a lion to prove her courage and the masculine aspect that she has. So just like Dorga, very interesting. So she just like Dorga rides a lion. Wands encrusted with stones, as was an also another sacred symbol to her. And some of her priestesses would put wands with stones encrusted and use that in, in, in rituals to Inanna. And the eight-point star, very connected as well uh, to Venus energy. So Venus is also connects to the five-point star and also the eight-point star in some of her myths. And the rose, the rose is also a flower that is connected to a lot of different goddesses, mostly love goddesses. We have Mary Magdalene, is, her symbol is the rose. We have Venus and Aphrodite, their symbol is also the rose. And here we have Inanna, also Ishtar, very connected to the rose. So just wanted to point that out. These are all symbols of Inanna that are also seen in other goddesses. You can go to the next slide for me. So here is an example of an invocation to Inanna. Mighty, majestic, and radiant, you shine brilliantly in the evening. You brighten the day at dawn. You stand in the heavens like the sun and the moon. Your wonders are known both above and below. To the greatness of the holy priestesses of heaven, to you, Inanna, I sing. So this is a sacred invocation translated to English. Can go to the next slide for me, please. 
So here is the descent of Inanna. This is one of Inanna's most famous stories or myths, what Inanna is most, most known for. And the oldest known myth in Babylonian is Babylonian, and it was written on clay tablets in the third millennium BC. It is usually known as the descent of Inanna, the Sumerian queen of heaven and earth. This myth is about the meeting of the queen of heaven with her sister, Erishkago, queen of the underworld. It is a story about meeting the dark shadow side of one's self. This is the story of the original duality, the Gemini story of our other half. So this myth is very associated to the sign of Gemini in astrology. Very interesting. There is definitely a connection there. Go to the next slide for me. Okay, so this is a meditation that we'll do in a moment. Um, you're a Gemini? Okay, so, oh, okay. So you guys might, might find this in the story interesting. Um, Melanie, if you can stop sharing, then I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the myth of Inanna. Thank you, Mel. All right, so why is the myth of Inanna so interesting? So Inanna, being the queen of heaven, uh, had her, her sister, who was Arishkago, was queen of the underworld. So we've got queen of heaven versus the queen of the underworld. Now, Inanna was responsible Okay, some say on purpose, some say accidentally. That's one of those one of those interesting things about myths that are very debatable, right? Depends on how you want to view it. But she was responsible for the death of the husband of Erishkogo. Okay. So because Erishkogo's husband died due to a war that she had enacted or that she was part of, she felt a sense of duty or guilt, guilt and duty to face her sister, Arishkago, pay her respects to her dead brother-in-law and kind of atone for causing his death, okay? In some myths, they say that she arrogantly decided to face Arishkago. And in some myths, they say, there's like different versions to the myth. They say that she was repentant and she wanted to make it up to Arishkago. So she decides to take a trip to the underworld to face her sister. When she goes to in her trip to the underworld, she's remember, she's the queen of heaven. So she has to descend to the earth and go through many gates to get to the underworld. One of Arishkagol's priestesses meets her at the first gate and says, you cannot enter fully clothed into the underworld you must remove an article of clothing which each gate that you cross until you reach the queen, right, Arishkogo. So she starts to remove an article of clothing in each gate until she faces Arishkogo completely naked, standing in front of her, fully vulnerable. So they say that this particular myth is talking about the seven chakras and how we go from the very top chakra all the way to the root chakra which is where we go from the spiritual into the physical so when our soul comes into our body right they say the soul some people say the soul comes in through the crown chakra okay but definitely Definitely, that is where the soul comes in and takes physical form until we are fully formed in all seven chakras. So Ali asks, is that the dance of the seven veils? Yes, that is the dance of the seven veils, which is a, a belly dance. Um, there is more than seven chakras. Yes, we, do, we have more than seven chakras. Absolutely. But those are what we call the seven main chakras, the seven chakras that most people refer to and most known in, in, in myths is the seven chakras. But we have more. We have many more. We have chakras that reach all the way to infinity and we have chakras in different parts of our body. But there's, there's seven physical chakras. In other words, that we can, there are, there are seven main chakras where most of our energy is concentrated through seven chakras. Now, the interesting thing about this myth 
is that it talks about when she removes an article of clothing in each gate, she's actually removing a part of her consciousness. She's removing a part of her ego, right? She's removing the layers of her ego in order to be able to stand vulnerable and complete in front of her sister. So this is definitely, it is a story of shedding the ego, shedding the shadow, the shadow parts of ourselves. That's why they say that this is so related to Gemini because Gemini is supposed to be the sign of duality. We have two sides, right? There is, there is that side of us that is us and then we have our shadow side, right? And just like we have a shadow side, we all have a shadow side. We all have things about ourselves that we're not happy with. We'd like to let it, let it go, right? And those are the things we work on through life in order to be able to reach that part where we feel like we have ascended or transcended all of our earthly ego or all of the things that, that anchor us to earth, right? All this karma that we come to work on. So this story of Inanna is showing how even the queen of heaven, the queen of the universe, like the highest goddess, had to do the same thing. She had to shed her ego. She had to shed her shadow. She had to confront the negative things about her that she'd rather not confront, but had no choice in order to be able to receive forgiveness, in order to be able to transcend. Okay, so that's why her story is very significant. Now, when she faces Arishkogol, Arishkogol does not forgive her. Arishkogol says, you, I, I don't, I, be gone from me. You, you, need to, you need to not only repent for what you did, you need, to, you need to suffer. You need to face death. So she has her killed. And they hang her from a hook. Her dead body hangs from a hook in the underworld. For three days, does that sound familiar? She's dead for three days in the underworld. Now, her priestesses, she left behind a note to one of her priestesses and said, if in three days I am not back, that means something happened, please send help. She lets her priestess know. So when three days have gone by and no one had heard from Inanna, they sent a priestess to the underworld to help her and what they found was that she was dead so they provided a potion to bring her back to life to bring her back to consciousness on the third day they take her off the hook Arish Kogol allows her to leave but tells her priestess that in order for Inanna to go back to heaven she needs to send someone to replace her now somebody has to take her place so the priestess takes Inanna back up to heaven, to her kingdom. And Inanna turns around and searches through the kingdom to see who cried for her, who lamented her death. This is where her, the priestess is that does her lamentations, her songs of lament come in. And she searches throughout and all of her priestesses and all of the people that surrounded her were deep in mourning, thinking that she was dead, except for one person her husband. Her husband was partying. Her husband was happy. Her husband was happy that she was gone. Why? Because she was, he was a shepherd who became king through her. He became her prince and her consort and her king because she was queen. So he was enjoying the fruits of her labor. He was enjoying the fact that he was married to her, but didn't truly love her. So she said, since you are faithless, you did not mourn me, you will take my place. So Demuzi, her husband, is the one that takes her place in the underworld. But Demuzi's father, who was also a god, said, well, that's not fair that my son has to completely take your place. And he makes a deal with Arishkago. And he says, let my son be in the underworld for six months. But in six months time, he comes up to the surface and gets to be with his family and gets to be with me. So therefore, here we have the interesting twist, right, that we see, remember, with Demeter and Persephone, right? So this is an interesting twist where he gets to be the Persephone in the story. So the six months that he is in the underworld, it was winter for the Sumerians and the Babylonians. 
and the six months that he is on earth, it's summer and spring for the Sumerians and the Babylonians. So here we see the myth and story of Persephone and Demeter, right, of the underworld versus, and here we have the same story, except this time it's a man that has to be down in the underworld, right, not a woman such as Persephone. So as you can tell, there's so much interesting twists that we have with world mythologies and stories of the different gods and goddesses there are there's definitely a connection you know the whole three days in the underworld dead and then resurrects comes back to life goes up to heaven right uh very very the stories are intertwined between cultures and that's very true and here and here is a good good example and then you have the whole concept of spring summer winter and fall except this time instead of it being Persephone it's the Muzi so we, here we have a man taking the place of Persephone yes Joseph Campbell highlights in his books exactly yes Joseph Campbell um I love his books Joseph Campbell is an amazing amazing writer and yeah and he's correct and so is Carl Jung when Carl Jung said all of the world's myths are connected and we're all connected through the collective unconscious. And, and this is true. We are connected to the collective unconscious. All of the world's myth have things in common. There's archetypes and their stories to pretty much explain everything. Now, the interesting thing that I wanna add about Inanna in her stories is that Inanna is considered an Anunnaki and so is Enki, her father. Now. Have you guys ever heard of the Anunnaki? No? Okay. So. Yes. Sorry, I was really far from my computer. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. So if you guys ever want to take a deep dive through the rabbit hole of rabbit holes, look up Anunnaki and look up Planet X and look up Niburu and you'll have a really good time. You'll go through the rabbit hole of all rabbit holes. So there's a theory that we were created by aliens and those aliens are the Anunnaki that came from the planet X or planet Niburu. So there's tons of different myths, stories, explanations. I mean, like I'm saying, it's a rabbit hole. You will have totally totally different variations of the story but basically we are supposedly created by the Anunnaki that's one of the stories one of the myths of how earth came about and how humans came about is that the Anunnaki literally created us and then left so whether that's true or not true that's you know, up to your own personal interpretation, like I'm saying, a rabbit hole of all rabbit holes. Really, was very, I, very interesting. Go ahead. May I? May yes, I? absolutely. Um, like she said, rabbit hole, which means like there's all kinds of twists and turns and you can decide what truth is for you. Mm -hmm. um, but I like to point in each direction. So yes, there's some, there's some studies of that um, some left and like the planet was destroyed they took the gold because they came down here to mine gold which they needed to save their planet which is why a lot of us were miners in the beginning of our lives and all this kind of stuff and then some say that some anunnaki ended up staying and anunnaki if you actually look at history and bones and giants as an example you see egyptians talk about giants which could be considered anunnaki there's other places that have people instead of having like our rounded heads they had more of like an oval head and that's where like if you look at pastors or priests they were wearing these big hats and it was behind their head which means that they had like these oval heads and that means that they were anunnaki based um people and their bones their heads themselves are actually oval like so really cool information so some supposedly stayed and they died here and they lived hundreds of years and some left and um, Enki and Enlil can be found as like the main Anunnaki and they are in Egypt and in Babylonian and in Mesopotamia stories, which are the beginning of any civilization found. So, and it's like the same pictures. If you look at like the caves and you look at all the pictures that were taken and the, uh, what were these called? These clay things that they would make, all of them have the same pictures. Absolutely yep. crazy. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Thank you.
yeah, so thank you for, for putting that quote for the Gaia article. Thanks a lot. Appreciate that. So yeah, so Inanna was considered an Anunnaki. The Enki was her family, part of her family. So she was technically an Anunnaki. Yeah. Yeah, Gaia has a lot on Anunnaki. They do. So yeah, so if you ever, if, if guys, if you're ever bored and you, and you wake up with the, I want to know more about the origins of life and yeah, do a search on Anunnaki and you will have plenty to look at. Plenty, plenty to research. Very interesting. But yeah, so, so Inanna is a fascinating goddess. Very interesting goddess. Um, people don't talk about her as much. She's not as well known as she could be. Um, you know, everybody focuses on other goddesses like Venus, Aphrodite. Definitely the Roman and Greek goddesses um, are more known, right? We're more familiar with them. But Inanna is a fascinating goddess, very fascinating goddess, one of the oldest goddesses in existence that we know of. So just that fact alone makes her a fascinating goddess to research. I loved researching Inanna. It was very interesting. And Ishtar and Astarte. And, and it's funny, I had a client named Astarte. And I always thought her name was so weird. This is way before I did all this research. And I was like that name, Astarte. And then when I started to research, it was so fascinating. I was like, oh, Astarte. Okay. So connected to Ishtar, connected to Inanna, name of a goddess. Of course, she had no idea. Her mom just thought it was a pretty name. But very interesting, very interesting, the vibration of a name, right? And the, the meaning behind the name. Does anybody have any questions about Inanna? Anything you want to add? Any questions you have uh, or comments on her story, on her myth? Uh, do you have information about, I believe her name is Inhidwana, which is like the first priestess of Inanna and supposedly she wrote like the first book, um, the first poem and book specifically on loving on Inanna and devoting on her? I can get you information. I, cool. I've I have tons of research. I couldn't put it all in the presentation because like <laughs> one hour is not enough <laughs> to talk about everything. But but you know, we're going to cover this uh, just at FYI for the ladies that are in the Goddess Academy. We are going to cover that in the month of February. It's all about Inanna. We're, we're doing um, goddesses of the ancient world. So we're going to talk about Inanna, Ishtar. We're going to talk about... Um, uh, the labyrinth and Ariadne. We're going to talk about the uh, Etruscans and the Minoans. Like, we're going to do a deep dive into ancient, ancient goddesses. So, we're going to talk a little bit more about Lilith. Like, even though we covered Lilith, but we're going to cover her from a different angle. So, yeah, we're going to do a lot of deep diving into ancient goddesses in the month of February. And then this 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 month, we're doing goddesses of the Far East. And then we're going to do Native American goddesses in March. Or we're going to talk about Pele and Ixchel and, um, you know, um, Grandmother Spider and all of the different um, Native American goddesses. So, yeah, for anybody in the Goddess Academy, we're, we're doing lots of deep dives coming up. It's going to be interesting. Uh, but I can get you that information, Jasmine. And I'm going to have that for the Goddess Academy, too. All right, ladies, if there's no further questions, we're going to do a little meditation to get acquainted with Inanna. Um, I'd like you all to close your eyes, get comfortable. And we're going to do a meditation where we get to connect to the energy of Inanna. And take a deep breath. You can put yourself off camera if you like. Now, I'd like you all to visualize yourselves standing in a field with a big tree next to you. And notice that next to this tree, there is a huge clearing. As you walk 
toward this clearing, you notice that the area is getting a little more narrow, okay? So it's like an incline going down. Now we're going to visit Inanna. She's going to join us on a journey to the underworld where we will encounter Erishkagal and Inanna. So we're stopping in the first gate. As you come down this clearing, you notice that there is a gate. And notice that next to you is a beautiful woman with wings. She has materialized next to you and has identified herself as Inanna. Inanna smiles and says, please leave an article of clothing on the first gate. Along with this article of clothing, you are leaving behind something in this year, in 2021, something that you do not want to bring into your next year. Or something that you want to leave behind for yourself that is no longer a part of your life. Leave that behind as you symbolically take off one of your articles of clothing. It could be anything. It could even be a hat. It could be a pair of earrings. Anything you want to leave behind in this gate. You hang it from the gate and continue to walk until you reach the second gate. There Inanna tells you, Leave behind something that you do not want to bring in to your year or into your life at this point in time. Something you want to leave behind. It could be a part of your personality. It could be a problem. It could be a shadow that you no longer want to face and you want to leave it. So this is your second gate. Leave your second item hanging from the gate. You notice as you continue to walk that it seems to be going down. It seems like the land is going down, almost like you're going down a hill or a mountain, it's slowly going down. Very, very slowly, but you notice that there is a shift. Now you go to the third gate. And once again, you leave something behind. Leave the next article of clothing on the third gate. Now we go to the fourth gate. And once again, we leave something behind. Something that no longer supports you. Now we go to the fifth gate. Once again, leave something behind. I'll give you a moment to do that. Now you keep walking. And now we approach the sixth gate. And as we approach the sixth gate, you leave one more article of clothing one more thing you want to leave behind. Leave it hanging on the sixth gate. Now when you're ready, 
you're going to walk to the final gate. By the time you reach this gate, you should be quite naked. And if you're not naked yet, you will be once you walk through this gate. Leave behind your last article of clothes. The last thing you want to leave behind. As you open this final gate, Inanna has been walking with you this whole time. You face Erishkago as she waits for you at the end of the gate. You notice that it is dark and there are torches on the walls. You have entered the underworld. Irishka Gol now faces you and says, have you left behind everything you wanted to leave? Everything that has not supported you in the past? Everything that you no longer want to be part of your life now? This is the moment to shed everything. Shed all the things you don't like about yourself all the things you want to get rid of. She informs you that as you took off each article of clothing on the gate, that when you come back up from this journey, you will put on those articles of clothing, but this time they have been transformed. You now get to change those things about yourself and become aware of them so that when you are done with this journey, you know what you wanted to leave behind and what you want to bring up. Because now you get to bring into your life the opposite of what you left behind. So if you left behind pain, you get to bring back joy. She wraps her arms around you as you stand there naked and vulnerable in front of Arishkago next to Inanna, who has already experienced the same thing you have. She hugs you. And as she hugs you, you feel the energy of Arishkago and the energy of Inanna as she also hugs you. You feel their beautiful energy coursing through your body the duality of heaven and the underworld, the light and the dark as they mold together and become who you are, the beautiful and perfect woman that you are right now. As you stand here in your most vulnerable moment, know that you are being empowered by the light and energy of these two goddesses. She infuses you with energy. Inanna hugs you and tells you, you're going to go through all the different gates. But this time, you're going to take on the opposite of what you left. Every negative thing you left behind, as you put on the clothes that you hung on each gate, you're bringing in the opposite energy so that you will be empowered to make those changes in your life. As Arishkago hugs you one last time, Inanna holds your hand and leads you out of the underworld. And now you're going to step up to the seventh gate. Put on the article you left there. And continue on each gate as you put on the article of clothing you left until you reach the first gate. I will give you a couple of minutes to do that as you put on that energy of empowerment.
if you have reached by now the first gate, and you are ready to come back. Go ahead and come back through the last gate, one where you started. Be back in your chair when you're ready. And when you feel ready, you can open your eyes. And if you like, you can share your experience. If you'd like to let us know what that felt like. Anybody ready to share their experience? You can tell us how it felt. Did you feel the energy of the goddesses? Yes, we did. Okay. Was it a good experience for you? It was for me. Anybody else? Sorry, my dog was barking. <laughs> no, it okay. was amazing. It was beautiful. Thank you. Um, I connected uh, oddly more than I thought I would. And I, I find that that's kind of what it's like, right? It's uh, the ones that you connect to are ones that are typically unexpected. But yeah, no, it was amazing. And I feel lighter, I guess is a good way to put it just shedding shedding those layers the necessary layers so yeah much needed must much necessary especially at the beginning of the year so thank you you're welcome i'm glad it's awesome don't worry julie the good thing is this is being recorded and you can play this again with time and enjoy it I'm sorry, guys, if I was a little, if I sounded a little rushed, it's only because I didn't want to go over time and keep you guys too long. So I, ho I hope I didn't sound rushed. Um, if I did, my apologies. Just take the same concept. Not at all. No? Okay, good. Good. Sometimes I feel like maybe I'm talking too fast. <laughs> it's kind of hard to, to, you know, judge myself. Oh, okay. Yes. So um, I do this every month, Julie, with a different goddess. So yeah, I did one for Freya last month. Um, and then I also had one to Bridget. So I do a different goddess every month. Next month is Venus. So we're going to talk about Venus, you know, and um, March, we have a very interesting goddess that I've never covered before. And it's one of one of the goddesses that we're covering in the Far East. And that's Benzai Ten, which is very near and dear to my bestie, who is also our lead enchantress, Marlu, who's on the call. And that's her goddess. So she's a fascinating goddess. And we're going to take a deep dive in March on Benzai Ten. I'm sure you, if you're not familiar with her, fascinating goddess to, to hear about. So, yeah, we learn about goddesses every day. I am so connected to goddess energy. And I love doing these circles. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And uh, if you weren't able to do the meditation, please listen to the replay and do them. And for all those that are listening that couldn't be here, I would love for you to do this meditation. Let me know. You can put in the comments if you're in the goddess chat in the in the red tent uh, goddess chat um just let me know how it felt if you liked it if you felt connected um i love this meditation i think it's so significant and it's it goes so well with 
with the um, with the legend and the stories and the myth of Inanna. So I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll we'll go ahead and end it because it's in a couple minutes. We've got the new moon circle, which you guys are all invited to. And um, we're also highlighting Inanna in that new moon circle. So hope you enjoy it. Love you, ladies. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, ladies. Bye. Bye.